More on the fight against corruption in governments. I'm joined now by Ariel Braun, professor of international relations and political science at the University of Toronto and associate of the Davis Center at Harvard University, live in New York. Hi there. Welcome to the broadcast, Professor. Hello. The fate of uh, Brazil's former president, Lula da Silva, is really hanging in the balance. And what's ironic is he's the front runner in the upcoming election. Tell us more about this. He is very popular in uh, many circles in Brazil because he has been viewed as someone who reduced the inequality that has existed in Brazil. The problem is that Brazil has been seized for a long time by a kind of systemic corruption. It has retarded the growth of that country. The Brazilian economy is in deep trouble. It has been said, for example, that the Brazilian economy is moving from one that has been characterized as a zombie economy to one that is more like the walking dead. The growth rate this year might be uh, a little bit over 2 percent. Last year was 1 percent. It is inadequate given the population growth rate. So corruption has to be addressed. It's a very difficult thing to do. And there are all these uh, political divisions where there's a great deal of suspicion on the part of the supporters of Mr. Uh, uh, Lula da Silva that this is politically motivated. But sadly, uh, the reality is that there has been corruption that is really widespread in Brazil. Let's move on to Jacob Zuma and Pak Kun Hei. How have their alleged actions impacted their respective countries? South Africa, again, has suffered greatly from that. And the ENC has tried to clean house. They uh, want to present themselves as a party that is finally tackling corruption, which had been so rampant, because now they're being challenged. Mr. Zuma is claiming that this is discrimination. So he is playing on the suspicions, is playing on the fears of his supporters. So he is not only someone who, by many accounts, has been very corrupt, but he's also a very divisive political force. South Africa is only uh, ranked, um, you know, around 71st in terms of corruption out of 179 countries, but it has affected growth. And the expectations uh, that in the case of Brazil, in the case of South Africa, they were part of the BRICS, that they would be growing very fast, they would be engines of growth around the world, that has been disappointing. And corruption has been corrosive. Corruption can affect the growth of our country. It can affect the inequality of income and wealth distribution. And in these cases, it has been quite harmful. Okay, let's uh, move on to Africa itself, Nigeria, Rwanda, Botswana, Nibia. What is it going to take in these countries? Is it going to take the people standing up and saying enough because it's affecting the basic rule of law? You're entirely right. Uh, let me just say that there is no country that is entirely corruption free. So even when you look at the best examples, the countries that are ranked on the transparency uh, perception of corruption indices uh, as first, second, third, New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, even there you will have some examples of corruption. But in the cases of many of these African countries, Nigeria, for instance, corruption is so rampant that you don't have a proper business law. It retards investments. There's no security of capital and sometimes not even security of person. So money will flow out. There is a deterrence to money coming in. It retards innovation, and especially countries that are in very dire need of growing because mm -hmm. they have a lot of poverty. That is devastating. So it has to be addressed, and people are getting angry about it, and they are coming out in the street, but it is a very, very difficult task. It will take the people coming out. It will take some politicians who are willing to take a chance on uh, being responsive to the people and not just appeal at narrow political motives. All right. And unfortunately, this has not happened. Lastly, I would like to ask you about China. Has it been able to move the needle after its anti-corruption campaign? It's really snarred about 100,000 officials. It is trying really hard because in China, it's not so much economic growth, but in China, it ties in with political considerations. It ties in with political legitimacy. The Chinese Communist Party does not uh, have uh, another party or other parties opposing it. It is not a pluralistic system. So it needs to portray itself as a meritocracy. If there's corruption, that will 
therefore affect that perception that it is a uh, meritocracy. Uh, according to many observers, the needle has not m been moved far enough. If you look at uh, how China is perceived internationally, let's say from 2017 to 2018, it is still at number 77. So it's going to take some time for the needle to, to be moved, but I think the Communist Party uh, under Mr. Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, is really eager, virtually desperate, to tackle corruption. And we'll have to see what are the political repercussions of that, what are the economic effects of that. Well, Professor Ariel Braun, thank you so much for joining us from San Francisco.